Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining our weekly podcast, Redefining Medicine. I am happy to welcome Dr. Dane Goodnow, a neuroscientist, researcher, and inventor focused on the physiology of disease and the correction of biochemical dysfunctions to treat disease. Dr. Goodnow, welcome. Well, thank you, Lindsay. It's very nice to be here. I look forward to chatting with you on these important topics of the day. Your research into biochemical mechanisms of disease started over 30 years ago. What are some of the most surprising or impactful discoveries you have made within the current span of your career? Well, thank you, Lindsay. That's an interesting question. It's been a long time. And so when we first started this, what started was an invention back in 1999 called non-targeted metabolomics. And it really allowed me to look at thousands and thousands of small molecules simultaneously in any kind of biological fluid. And this technology was used for functional genomics in animals and plants and and then obviously in the medical industry. And at first it was like a, you know, a candy store of biomarker discoveries in terms of the diagnosis of disease. And so understanding diagnostic biomarkers of disease was what the focus was on. And this technology allowed me to diagnose virtually all human diseases based upon their biochemical profiles, which was great. But then as time went on, these things started overlapping with each other. And this concept of disease prodromes came into play because originally the thought was, Hey, someone has a disease. It's a symptomatic thought about it. Right. And so there's got to be a biochemical correlate to this disease. And that's actually true. And we think often when we fix the disease or what we think we fix the disease, like say surgical removal of a tumor, for instance, or the successful treatment of a, of a particular um, disease symptomology, you would think that those biomarkers would go back to normal because the biomarkers are present with the disease, supposedly. And that's true for some biomarkers. But what became really weird was so many of these biomarkers didn't change. Um, They pre-existed the disease and they became prodromes of these diseases. So when we fixed the disease symptomology, we didn't actually fix the underlying risk factor. It's kind of like the concept of type 2 diabetes and complications from type 2 diabetes. And so what turned out was an initial dig into how do we diagnose these diseases for population screening and so on into, wow, these biochemical changes are occurring long before. And so in Alzheimer's, these plasmalogens, about seven years before we see clinical symptoms, these biochemical changes are occurring. So that was the biggest thing. And so all these human diseases like phosphocholine and pancreatic cancer and liver disease and these gastrointestinal tract acids for colon and pancreatic cancer and ovarian cancer and and the plasmalogens for Alzheimer's disease. These these prodromes, these biochemical prodromes prodromes were pre-existing the disease and continuing on through the disease. And so that was really the biggest thing. And then realizing that disease, as we call disease, is really an inaccurate term. Disease is really a symptom of a biochemical dysfunction. And then we think of diseases actually as a a learning experience. They actually, it's almost like you're in your castle and the the enemy's at the gates, but the disease show us where there's weaknesses in the walls. And so that creates, you go back up the chain of, of, of causality and you start saying, well, we can anticipate where certain weaknesses are and we can build biochemical reserves in advance of disease. And so that's kind of where it's gone progressively from Here's a disease. Can we find the biomarkers of the disease so we can diagnose the disease? Two, whoa, where's this disease coming from? Um, What's the underlying biochemistry prodrome of this disease to finally saying, well, if we understand the prodrome of the disease, why don't we, in advance of those diseases, create additional reserve capacity, both in biochemistry, but also in functionality? Because disease can't coexist with function. So those are the big, it's really a philosophical change. And so now, when we're looking at diseases, they become simpler um, and uh, less complicated. Dr. Good, now tell us more about prodrome sciences, your role and the mission of the company as a whole. Yeah, prodrome sciences is interesting. So I started this whole process from the pharmaceutical industry perspective. Okay, so when I finished school, I worked in the pharmaceutical industry. And when I invented the initial technology, 
Um, the first thing I did is I, I created a pharmaceutical company, okay, a company called Phenomenome Discoveries. And this company built diagnostic equipment, we built, we did clinical trials, and then I'm a synthetic organic chemist, so we designed non-natural um, metabolic intermediates, like PPI 1011, and these molecules that could be reformed in the body to give these biochemical precursors. And then that's, that was my understanding. It was the only way we could actually get medicine in the world, okay? And so I was young and ambitious and we did this work. We created incredible technologies, but it became self-limiting. So some of these molecules that we're developing, ultimately they're, they're, they're natural. Um, there's many ways you can't patent natural molecules. And when you wanna look at simple molecules like N-acetylcysteine or acetyl-L-carnitine that are important for mitochondrial function, and how do you incorporate those things into clinical trial protocols? In the pharmaceutical industry, every time I want to bundle, if I want to create a package that has a plasmalgin precursor plus a mitochondrial support molecule, plus you know, phospholipid support in terms of a, a phosphoalcholine type molecule, each of those individual components need to be independently validated and tracked through that system. Okay. And it leaves you very little room for modification. Now, the adaptive trial designs have improved over the years and just now becoming much more in vogue. But it became clear that in order to achieve you know, success in a disease like Alzheimer's disease, it's not going to happen through the existing mechanisms because um, you just don't have the flexibility to modify programming. And so Proteome Sciences is, is a complete rewrite of that entire model. It's basically taking all of my patent technology and reconverting them into essentially open source technology. Um, and so that we have, and get away from this claim language. Okay, in, in, the, in the pharmaceutical industry, it's all of the regulations are based upon what you claim a particular entity does. Okay, so you have to say, this drug does this purpose and that claim is on my label and I can't go off that label. If I do any kind of off-label marketing, um, I can go to jail. It's not, it's not a very healthy thing to do. And so when you have base molecules like an N-acetylcysteine or our plasmalogen molecules, these are involved in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and multiple sclerosis and autism. And so how do you deal with core biochemical systems within the patent system and within the phase one, two, three drug development program? It just doesn't work. And so what really Proteome Sciences is, is about rewriting that whole model and saying, you know what? we're out of the claim business. Okay, we are in the business of measuring biomarkers in the blood and providing people with a distribution analysis like high, low, medium, make no diagnostic claims, okay? Doctors are educated into understanding what these biochemical changes mean and their associations with diseases. And so the doctors themselves can interpret this information and draw those conclusions. Physician patients themselves can. And then the supplement model is the redesign of all these drug-based metabolic intermediates into generally re recognized as safe molecules so that they can be used on a broader base. And so give the physicians the maximum amount of power to modify and develop protocols and then use the population as a whole to test this stuff in real time in safe um, physician um, you know, supervised activities. And so that's what Proteome, so, so Proteome Sciences is designed to be a, a conduit between patients and their physicians so that they can actually maximize the objective improvement of their health. Like you can measure the changes in your, your blood cholesterols or your triglyceride fasting, fasting triglycerides, your aldehydes or your cholines and your plasmalogen. And then you can correlate that with your improved performance in terms of whether cognitive improvement, mobility improvement. And this puts a power into the physician's hands and it gets, puts the power into the population's hands. And so as we control and drive larger clinical trials, you know, the numbers are what really matter. And you know, we can't get away from good science. Like we have to run sufficiently large, robustly designed trials that provide objective endpoints. But this is the way to do it. And so that's what Proteome Science is completely designed differently from a pharmaceutical based company. It's all pharmaceutical mindset based. Like we still take that same level of, of critical quality control, quality assurance programming, but we take it towards a completely different 
um, open open label model, and then um, and then that's that's what we're doing. So our big job really is to build tools that help physicians build their place their 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 businesses, build their marketplaces, and through that network of individuals, um, we'll um, systematically and iteratively get better at what we do. And final question. You will be speaking at the upcoming Brain Health Summit taking place June 26th and 27th on two topics. Will you provide us with brief previews on these topics and explain why these topics are so important for clinicians to understand? So I have two very fun presentations, if you can call talking about disease and death fun, but it's fun because one talk is on good oxygen and bad oxygen and mitochondria, oxidative stress, and neurodegeneration. And so the concept of oxidative stress and reactive oxygen species is a very, very old, well-established situation in human health. And it's, a, it's involved in multiple human health related issues. So mitochondria are one of those situations where that it's a core component of your entire physiological operation. And so this talk talks a little bit about how we use molecular oxygen from the atmosphere, burn it into with hydrocarbons to create energy. And that energy is used to charge a battery. And that battery is this proton gradient in our mitochondria. And then that battery runs a pump called the ATP pump. And that's how we survive. And ultimately every cell of the body dies by mitochondrial failure, but it could be a thousand different ways. And it's reactive oxygen species and how it creates it and how it creates inflammation in the brain and how it it creates a chemoattractive signal for the microglia. So this talk is about good oxygen and bad oxygen, how we need oxygen to live. We can't survive without oxygen. Okay, oxygen is used to reduce all these, these, these electrons, but also when our systems get overwhelmed, it is the source of oxidative stress from the superoxide radical and onward. So I give a straightforward presentation on that and also practically how you deal with it and how you can measure excessive oxidative stress and how different um, supplements and treatments can reduce oxidative stress and what the consequences and benefits are of that. So that's about the core concept of our operating, you know, engine of the human body. So good oxygen, bad oxygen, and, and that's how our mitochondrial systems function. The second talk is called good fat, bad fat. And that's about plasmalogens and membranes and brain function. Another well-established modality of aging is the membrane dysfunction theory of aging. And one of the common things of aging is the brain shrinks. And the brain is fat. It's made of of, um, lipids. It's the highest concentration of cholesterol in your body. And it's it's a very fat-based organ. And it shrinks. And plasmalogens are kind of like water to dehydrated fruit. And the the brain is basically dehydrated when it gets older because it shrinks. It doesn't have the lipids it normally has. And the neurological functioning that allow our brain to do the things it does, the brain is essentially a quantum mechanical device. It simulates basically the Feynman two-slit experiment models of of awareness because of of the massive computing power that the, the brain has. And that massive computing power is due to the lipid composition and its ability to fuse and release neurotransmitters that connect one neuron from another. And so lipids have both a functional component in that they provide the body structure, every single trillion trillion cells, and they're defined by their three-dimensional membrane structure. That's what gives us physical structure. So we're not like a vat of of brewing beer. And then we have, um, and all the communication between cells and all the proteins live in membranes. So lipid, composition and function is really the matrix of the body uh, operation. So I talk about good fat and bad fat and how that, that distribution changes as we get older and how the membrane composition, as it changes from high phospholipids and high plasmalogens, which decrease when we get older, cholesterol accumulates and we get amyloid formation, we get impaired reverse cholesterol transport, cardiovascular issues. And so good fat, bad fat is talking about how the lipid composition of the body is actually the main uh, matrix that the body functions in and how we can modify and manipulate that. And what what features in a simple blood test, you can see if someone has deficiencies. 
Like people have phosphatidylcholine deficiencies in their blood supply, they typically have cholesterol manufacturing issues and, and simple things that are, um, that are missed by most people. Because we, we focus on the esoteric end game when we forget that there's some basic core principles of the human body that need to get met. So I tell people I'm the simplest scientist in the room. Like I deal with just the real basic operations. And then when you want to do more fancy stuff with peptides and exosomes and all that kind of stuff, like if you can keep these mitochondria, your membrane lipids and your, your lipid manufacturing in place, then whatever additional um, specialized procedures that you're going to do for a patient that has a very specific disease indication that you want to deal with, you're just going to get better performance in all of those, those areas if you can make sure that the, the core operating functions of the body are, are there. And they're the, they're, we seem to forget about them. And so biochemistry has been kind of a bit of a lost art. And so hopefully I can engage the community and they can have, um, they can learn a few things that they didn't, or remember a few things that they forgot they knew um, is probably a better way of putting it. And then realize that you can change all this. These are all modifiable endpoints. So that's, the, that's what I'm gonna share with the crowd. I understand you have a book coming out. Yes, so a book coming out called Breaking Alzheimer's. And it, it summarizes the last 15 years of my research in Alzheimer's and understanding plasmalogens, understanding um, what Alzheimer's really is. So people, it's changed. Like it's not a new disease. You know, some mother just woke up last night and said, wow, people are getting demented and they have these amyloid plaques and tangles. Like we've, this has been a hundred years. And so our understanding of Alzheimer's has changed dramatically over the hundred years of being looking at this disease. And so I kind of, and we, sometimes we forget what we used to know because we're always looking for the new thing and the new thing and the new thing. And so breaking Alzheimer's goes through the last, well, 50 years of Alzheimer's research, but focuses on the last 15 years of some very large longitudinal trials and interventions that we can do and teach people really what Alzheimer's truly is, how we can actually fix it and how um, Alzheimer's should be a rare disease and only in people who are ignorant of its underlying pathophysiology. And so, so Breaking Alzheimer's is an educational book, but it's also a call to action. And it comes up, brings up some of those previous questions of yours, Lindsay, about how to bring that into mainstream. And I believe Alzheimer's is the disease and the plasmalogen plus other supportive technologies is going to be the mechanism through which we can actually achieve um, um, institutional preventative medicine um, in, a, in a practical and meaningful way. Thank you so much, Dr. Goodnell, for spending your time with us today and sharing your insight and expertise. We truly appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure chatting with you.